Hello, juniors, seniors, wherever you may be. It is the week of the 20th of April. And so um, not a lot left, um, especially for uh, you guys as seniors. Um, next Monday will be the, uh, the beginning of your last week. And so two more Mondays left in your high school career. And I'm sure it's probably not uh, finishing up like you might have thought it would have. Uh, and I'm sure sad to see you guys go. Uh, but we got some work to do before then, and so I want us to finish up well. Uh, we'll do this again at the end, but this is a reminder that all of you have questions on James Chapter 2 that are due on Wednesday of this week, um, 23rd, so 23rd, 22nd, excuse me, I don't know, Wednesday. Uh, do we even really know what day it is anymore? Uh, they're due on the 22nd. Uh, by midnight that day and then again we'll have one more session of them and seniors you'll have just one more set of those so uh, do well it's not busy work do some bible study and, and get something good out of it uh, i want to share screen with you here today and we're going to be a little longer this week in our time together just because we're not doing this as many days of the week um, on wednesday you'll have a new lecture that'll be uh, on chapter three and and then we'll do chapter four and uh, we'll see if we get done uh, juniors you'll probably still be with me for chapter uh, five uh, real quick before i do that uh, i wanted to show you i'm wearing my favorite uh, bible teaching shirt calvinism this shirt shows me i wanted to uh, be sure and wear that for you guys uh, here before the year got over with and you know very seldom do i ever wear a t-shirt when i'm teaching you guys so good chance to do that tonight we're in chapter two, verse 14, and I'm gonna read one verse because it summarizes our whole section and then we'll go through it uh, kind of a verse at a time and hopefully uh, answer some of these questions, or help you answer some of these questions uh, that you have assigned for this week as well. Here's what he says, verse 14 of James two. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Um, this is not, talking about salvation as being saved it is asking the question can a person who lives like this be saved meaning are they saved if they're living like this can it can it be that they even are saved um i mentioned at the start of our study of james that this is uh, paul and james seem to have conflict here and that's why it was one of the last books included in the new testament canon was the book of james um, for 300 years, as you see there in your notes, um, were these you know verses at odds with one another? And the answer is very simply and very easily, no, they're not at odds. They are simply discussing um, two sides of the same coin or more of a uh, knowledge slash application. If this, then that must be true. Um, James and Paul uh, don't contradict each other. They actually harmonize. James' argument is that faith, which has no works, is a dead faith. Um, this is not a saving text, as I say there in the notes, but a sign text. The proof is in, is in the text itself. If you are a Christian, you will live like a Christian. There's no debate about that. There's no discussion that can be had about that. If you say you're a Christian, you'll live like it. And so if you say all day you're a Christian and go out and live however you want to, the answer just is real simple is that you're not a Christian. You're not a believer. You've never met Christ. You've never had a life altering uh, meeting with Jesus Christ. Okay. It, it becomes at that point an impossibility to say, yeah, I know Jesus, but I go out and I live and do whatever I want to do. That according to verse 14 shows that there is no saving. Um, there's no salvation in that. There's no great, life change in that because that's really the point everyone in the gospels who met jesus loved him or hated him no one had a well it's okay but you know we'll see the pharisees the scribes they hated him they wanted him dead the disciples those others fell at his feet and worshiped okay so there's there's really no kind of middle uh middle of the road uh, as it is there okay it's a one or the other thing Faith reaches out to others in Christian love. So let's go on and see how he fleshes this argument out. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, 
if it does not have works, is dead. Um, meaning your belief system gives insight, gives instruction to your life, the way that you behave, the things that you do. And so James says in verse 15 and 16, if somebody comes up to you and says, hey, I don't have anything to wear. I'm, I'm poor, I'm homeless, I need some help. And you look at them and say, oh, well, go be warm. And, and nothing happens, you don't do anything. You haven't helped them at all. There's really no substance to that, okay? And in the same way he is saying, if you say you've met Christ and you have faith, yet you go live any way that you want to, you have no chance of being saved just as you telling somebody to go be warm has no chance of being warm unless something has happened. The, the, the arguments are, he's laying the arguments side by side. He's putting these things together. Verse 18, someone will say, you have faith and I have works. And he says, show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Those, those things, again, go together. It, it's, it's a dead faith if it's not there. If your behavior is not informed by your theology, then it, it, it's not there. There's nothing to it. Um, and and he, then he proves this with a pretty uh, remarkable thing he says in verse 19. You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe that and shudder. So here, here's my little speech to the Christian school guys. All of you who are listening to this for class know the right answers. Okay. If I ask you the Bible questions, you can tell me. You've been in Christian school, you've been in church, you've been in Sunday school, all, all that's fine. But James says, if that's all you got is the intellectual knowledge, you're no better off than demons or the devil himself. That there's nothing to your faith if it is simply a knowledge that you have up here. I mean, that's, that's a pretty big statement, right? If James looks at you, if, if the Bible looks at your faith and says, yeah, well, they have all the, they check all the, the right answers, but it doesn't change the way they live, then you're in the same boat as the demons and Satan himself. I mean, that's, that's something that ought to, if nothing else for you guys, I hope it gets your attention, is that you just realize that, man, you, you may have fooled me and you may have fooled, you know, all the teachers at school and whatever, but a faith that doesn't have actions to back it up, doesn't have substance is no better than being the devil in this passage. Verse 20, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. Okay, he, he, he's just driving the point home. Okay, he's just driving home and he just says there in verse 20, don't you get it? Don't you understand? And uh, I've got some word study in, in your notes that'll actually help you on some of those questions, okay? But uh, just that's, that's the point of this section. So wake up. The proof of the text is that there's got to be an accompanying faith. There's got to be an accompanying work, excuse me, with the faith. Otherwise, it's, it's no, no better than the, the demons, okay? Because it's just intellectual head knowledge, and it really hasn't changed anything. Which, by the way, let me chase rabbit for a minute. If you know this stuff, if you know that there is a God, and it hasn't changed your life, that, that terrifies me. Like, you know who God is and what he's done and what he expects, and you are unwilling to bow to that God and change the way that you live. And of all the people that, that you don't want to line up on the wrong side of, that, that's, that's got to be the number one, right? So I, I would beg you to consider that. I would beg you to get, reconsider that. Uh, here's the pattern. Here's what works look like. Verse 21, the triumph. Abraham was justified by his faith. Okay. Abraham's life. And I'm going to go through these things really quickly. He was called to leave uh, Ur. He was called to give up on his life, he, the things that he had, the, the, the family money, all, all that kind of stuff. Leave all that, go where I tell you to go um, and, and follow me. And over and over again, A, B, C, and D there, here's these things where he's just got to believe by faith. Hey, Abraham, I'm going to make you a, a great nation. And you got to believe me. You just got to give me time. And at the right time, I'll give you offspring. They're in their hundreds of years old. They're well past childbearing age. And eventually the child comes. And as soon as the child comes, 
not long after, what does God do? Hey, Abraham, give, give me your son as an offering. God wasn't going to take a child sacrifice. That's not what that story is about. That story is to show that Abraham's faith was fully invested in God. Did God need to know that? No, God already knew. Abraham learned through that. He learned that everything in his life that was tied up in Isaac, I mean, literally every promise God had made to him rested on Isaac. Was he going to be a great nation? Was he going to have any of the stuff that God had promised him if he didn't have a child? No, it all had to come through Isaac. And so Abraham believed that even if he gave Isaac, even if he killed him there, that God would resurrect him and still fulfill all his promises. And so that's the idea. All that we've built our life on, all of a sudden, can we trust God with that? We're sitting here in the midst of like a month-long thing where we're at home, and a lot of people have lost a lot of ability to do stuff. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be disappointed by those things. But like, if you're despondent, if you're just completely upset because of the privileges and the stuff that you've lost, you should be kind of concerned because maybe those things are the things that really bring you joy instead of God the Father. Like if, if all those things went away, if all the stuff that God has given you, if God took all that back, would you still worship him? Would you still love God to the same degree that you love him right now? Or do you just love him because of what he's given to you? If you just love him because of his blessings, then God's not your God, your stuff is. And you're just glad to have God there as a supplier of your stuff. And so that's who Abraham is. He gives it all back. And, and I put in your notes, that's the triumph. That's, that's the, the victory he had because he got credit for that because he fully believed God. And it showed in his actions. If he didn't fully believe that God could keep his promises, he's not giving his son on the altar. He's not offering uh, Isaac on that altar. But he fully believes God. And so it shows up in what he does. Verse 22 says this, faith was active along with his works. So the point of all this, and you can see all these things, that Abraham's works. What at all did he do on the way to give Isaac? Look in your notes. He rose up early. He saddled his donkey. He got his servants. He got the wood. He got the fire. He got Isaac. He went up the mountain. He built the altar. He laid Isaac on it. He raised, I mean, everything that he did, all of his actions were based on faith, that he believed God. And because he believed God, he did every one of those things that's there in your notes. He did all those things. Those were all actions that were results of what he believed. And so every action that you guys do is based on your belief. So when y'all do something, you know, in class for better or for worse, if you cheat on a test, if you tell a, a dirty joke, if you do for negative or for good, all of those things tell me, we, we all tell on ourselves. We, we tell what we really believe by what we do because all of our actions are informed by what we believe. You say, oh, not, no, Dr. Crow, I, I don't really think that. I'm just doing that. I'm not really racist. I just tell this joke. I'm not really that. Yeah, you are because that, th those are the things you become. Those are the things you do are based on what you really, really believe. Every single person in scripture, every page of this is covered with men and women who did what they did because of what they believed for better or for worse. Verse 23, scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him or counted him as righteousness and he became a friend of God. Again, all everything that he did was based on what he believed and what he believed then showed up in his life and it was imputed to him in verse 23. I mentioned here in the red in your notes, three imputations in scripture. Number one, we all get Adam sin because he's our federal head. We've talked about this in scripture, original sin. We were all born sinners because of Adam. If you have an earthly father, you have a sinful nature. It was imputed. It was given to you. Babies do wrong things, even though they're not taught to, because they are sinners by what's in here, not what's around them. Jesus then gets our sins imputed to his account on the cross. He gets what we deserve, imputation. And then when we get saved, that gets imputed back to us. We get the righteousness of God, even though we don't deserve it. We've never earned it. So this idea of imputation is a big deal, and it's here again in the scripture. And we've talked about it some in class. But here's what I want you to note in verse 23. He's then called the friend of God. And that's, that's a good place to be. You can either be the enemy of God by what you do, or you can be the friend of God. And here's the test in verse 24. 
you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And then he mentions Rahab as well in the same way Rahab, and again, did the same thing. Okay, so, and, and these are all the notes, so I'm not gonna, gonna belabor it. I'm gonna, gonna kind of tie this up with this idea, okay? And I had some song lyrics and I took them out before I sent it to you and I forgot to take out this line, so you can disregard that. Um, but works are a response to a life given to the Savior. If you love Jesus, you will do things that honor Jesus. Not all, I mean, you're not gonna be perfect. I'm not talking about that, but you will want to do those things. You will want to read scripture. You will want to go to church. You will want to pray. No one should ever, no one can force a Christian to do those things because it can't be forced. If you love someone, genuinely love someone, you do things, okay? Y'all have boyfriends, girlfriends, you love your parents, you love brothers and sisters, whatever it is. You just, you just do those things. I don't have to act like I love my kids or my wife. I just do. Why? Because it's really there. Okay. And so for, for some of you, depending on where you're going to go to college, call my Christian again, we've forced some of those things because you have to come to Bible. You have to go to chapel, da, da, da. But I, we can't make you love Jesus. Those are things that you would just do. And faith would be the impetus to do those things. That's what motivates us. Not so that Jesus will love me and save me. I do those things because he's already loved me and saved me. And so that shows up in my life. You, you can't fake it for better or for worse. You do what you know. And if you're a sinner and you want to stay apart from Jesus, you'll show that up. That'll be who you are in your life. And if you love Jesus, that'll be what shows up. But you can't pretend to be either one of those things. I mean, you are what you are. I mean, in that, there's, there's no way around that. Christians act like Christians. Non-Christians act like non-Christians. This is a nature issue. Faith and works go together. Not, again, to earn any of those things, but because those things have already happened. Those things have already taken place. So if you are a follower of Jesus, it will show up in your life. That's why I hope that this kind of rings true now, that you get the idea that I have had over the years concerns about some of you say, why are you acting like that? Well, I'm just being stupid. That concerns me because you can only be what your nature tells you to be. You know, we don't have to teach pigs to act like pigs or dogs to act like dogs. They do that because that's their nature. Well, you have one of two natures, either the one you were born with, the sinful nature that you got from your earthly father that's in Adam that we just read about, that sins and does what they want to do or the new imputed nature that Jesus gives us. And then we live like Jesus, but our nature always tells on us. And so as we forced you again for chapel and Bible, you're about to go seniors and it's going to be entirely about you and you're going to then make those choices. And what's going to drive those choices is the nature that is within you. Have you been born again through Jesus and thus have a Christ like nature, or are you going to continue to do those sinful nature things? That is up to you and so as we kind of wind this down here again we're down to you know single digit days here you know and just just a couple who are you going to be as you go on juniors as you finish this year and we come back to school in august and do your last kind of victory lap who are you going to be it's going to be informed by your nature faith and works go together and that's what the book of james tells us here in chapter two Okay, again, questions that are due this Wednesday, don't forget about those. And uh, we will have a new lecture on Wednesday as well that'll start in James chapter three. It's gonna deal with one of those nature things and that is how we talk, what comes out of our mouth. That is a big issue for all of us, uh, how, how we speak and the kind of way that we talk to one another and the things that we say and the things that we listen to as well. Okay, if there's anything I can do, be sure and email me, let me know. Uh, love you guys. Talk to you again very soon. Till I see you, go serve your king.